and I think we're live. I'm gonna post the link for everybody on our Slack. There you go. Um, so we're live, Adriana. Hi. Um, so to kick things off, um, everybody kind of knows the context of this. The idea is um, you have um, you have kind of a you're giving us this time of your of you of yours, sorry, to help people that are trying to make their first steps into the bioinformatics biotech sector so that is uh highly appreciated i know um so do you want to start by introducing yourself uh, what you do your company etc yeah sure <clears throat> i'm gonna apologize up front because i have a little cold um but i work as a biotechnology consultant um i know it sounds kind of vague whenever i say consultant i always think of um, like a business consultant that works for the big American firms like McKinsey or something like that. But um, I work as a consultant in that I help companies solve scientific problems, not business problems. Um, so a little bit of background on me. I got my PhD at University of California in Santa Barbara um, from the biomolecular science and engineering department. Um, program rather. So it's an interdisciplinary program that kind of grabs from all the departments. It's kind of like a bioengineering program. Um, and we get to work with different engineers and scientists. Um, and specifically what I did is I built biosensors. Um, so it's not technically like bioengineering per se, um, because I worked in the biochemistry department. So I have a really um, solid background in biochemistry, um, DNA, and things like that. Um, nice. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah, and and in terms of like, you know, how is my PhD different from what I do now? I kind of always knew that um, I didn't want to go into academia. I always knew that I wanted to be in industry. And so I set myself up for that pretty early on by networking with people and, and you know meeting with people who were in industry just to kind of get a feel of what it would be like. Good. How was the kind of uh, the transition after the PhD to like to the commercial sector or the the, the professional sector? Um it it's not that difficult. I mean, if you're in graduate school, they kind of train you to get ready for the transition. I mean, you either go off and do a postdoc, which is um, something I kind of toyed with in my head, but was um, not really in the cards for me because I knew that I wanted to do industry and I didn't really want to waste any time. And so um, I kind of just went you know, straight towards that in terms of, you know, like I said, going to conferences and networking and um, trying to meet with people who already had a job that I thought I would want. Um, but I do have to say that my my job is kind of different in that um, I have a company where I work remotely because I work from home. And that was just a lifestyle decision that I made. If you go straight and you work into industry, you know, you, you work in a lab and um, it's pretty straightforward. You have 401k and all that stuff. But um, my, I guess my job is kind of different because um, I just made this decision that I wanted to kind of be a, a freelance scientist. And I hate that word, like freelance, but it, it is it is kind of what I do. So Awesome. So this kind of uh, introduces us the, the the ones we don't know much about the, like bioinformatics or biotech can you like uh, really quickly tell us i don't know if one of your days at a job but uh, like applications or or like examples of something you do that combines technology or, or python just to put it a name yeah sure so um let's see so like there isn't really a normal an average day for me, but um, 
most of my work is computational. And so I, I went from being a bench scientist to um, transitioning all my work um, on the computer because that was how I could market my abilities um, to, to companies and work remotely. And so that's why I really um, transitioned into learning Python and um, you know writing little scripts here and there um, so that I could perform my job more efficiently. Um, but it really just depends on what the client wants. So um, because I sign a lot of NDAs, I can't tell you exactly what I do. Um, but really, generally speaking, it's like digital health. Um, okay. Good. Yeah. So the example I like to give everybody is like, if you have the flu, let's say you have the flu, you have to go to the doctor's office and sometimes they give you a test and um, then they would prescribe you some medication like Tamiflu. Tamiflu has to be given within a specific time period for it to work. But let's say if you could take your test at home and, you know, if you have kids or something like that, um, taking that test at home and then the doctor would prescribe you something and then it get delivered to your house via courier or maybe you go pick it up at the drugstore. Um, it'd be something akin to that. So I help them develop digital health technologies. And um, some of it is just like research, you know, like writing white papers and things like that. And then on the other side, it's like very computational where um, I'm looking at massive amounts of DNA sequences. And, you know, um, there are certain repositories online like GenBank and stuff where I get all these sequences and then, um, you know, run them through little scripts that I have to look for mutations or variants. And then um, I give those sequences back to the company and they help build their devices. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, especially now that there are so many of these trendy things like 23andMe and all these things we read every day in the headlines. So it, it does make a, a lot of sense. Um, out of curiosity, what a kind of like your technological stock, stock looks like. You you mentioned that you process uh, big sequences of DNA. Is that big, like really big? Doesn't fit in your computer? Do you have, how does that technological aspect, what libraries do you use? How much time, so you hit return or enter to run an experiment, how much time it takes? Do you run it in your own computer or is it something cloud? Yeah, so I don't do a lot of cloud computing. I don't, um, I just, I simply don't need it at this point. Um, so everything I can do is is locally on my own um, computer. And so I I use um, Jupyter to, to run my scripts. I, I love it. It's, you know, because then it's just like instant feedback. And so um, I'll use other software to kind of put the DNA all together. Um, but a lot of the cleaning and stuff is uh, done manually by me. And that's what I use the Jupyter for. Um, trimming sequences, lining things up properly, extracting them from, um, you know, from GenBank. Sometimes I use the command line, you know, and then like I'll take that and move it into Jupyter and work on it in there. There is a lot of uh, like hacking involved. <laughs> it's never straightforward. It's always this, every single project has like this workflow that's, I feel like it's always different, you know, and it's always like changing file formats and then, you know, like, I don't know. It's it's never as straightforward as I think it is in my head. I'm like, oh, this should only take an hour. And then I get down to like, oh, God, give me a week. <laughs> <laughs> then when they say that, uh, 70% of the data scientists job is doing data cleaning is when you understand like first you don't want to believe it but then when you're in the professional world it's like you feel it right yeah it's true i mean it's the same for genetic data too it's like everybody has their own file format and everybody has their own requirements for their software and you only want to use this type of software and yeah it's it's crazy yeah, I'm learning it as I go. I learn, I I learn every day. It's never straightforward. So we have uh, a couple of questions here that I could um, 
like uh, bring up, let me give me one second so I can open up the chat. But um, I can start if I. Sorry, I was trying to also pull the questions on the live chat. Um, but basically, we have a couple of questions that are um, ranging from some basic to some that are um, a little bit more specific, right? So um, something like, is it critical to have a data science or programming background, right, in your field? And I, I guess what they mean is like, do you have to have any formal training in, on computer science, or you can just hack your way into it? Um, OK, so I'm going to assume that you already have um, a science background. Um, I, I, I want to say that pretty much the computer part is, is hackable. Like, you can learn it, because I'm sitting here right now. Um, as living proof, um, I did next to zero programming um, in grad school. All of the data analysis I did was just, um, I don't know, we used Kaleidograph, which seems really antiquated compared to what I can do now. Um, but yeah, it's something that you could definitely learn. It's not required. It just depends on what you're interested in. Um, are you interested in, you know, when you when you say breaking into bi biotech, do you do you like working at the bench? Um, do you want to do that like that sort of, you know, science work, or do you prefer I, working with computers? I assume they already are in the sector based on their question. Like so, they are recent, recent bio related biochemistry, maybe graduates. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it does, if it interests you, then I would see if you can get onto our project, maybe with, um, I mean, if you're in school, look for another project that you can work on, collaborate with another PI and see if you can get um, some more experience. Um, yeah, but it's definitely learnable and, Gosh, there's so many different ways that you could learn. Uh, most of the learning I did was online. If you don't want to do like the classroom setting, it was like online and through self-learning, it's totally doable. Um, and it just depends on your interests, you know? Yeah. Good. So, yeah. So um, I was just like uh, formally asking the question, uh, but uh, given like your experience, you're a great example, you can learn everything you need without sitting four or five years in the computer side side of it right no i i would say not yeah i agree yeah um so there is one that uh you kind of already answer but um it says if you envision yourself when you graduated as a full-time consultant or working for an organization and also kind of a follow-up um that is if there is a if there is great demand for biotech consultants and what kind of education you have to need you need to, to to have in order to fill that role okay so um yes i always envisioned myself working in industry no i never thought that i would end up being a consultant in the in the way that i am now um it it all changed once I had a family and I decided that I, you know, I, I didn't want to be tied to the bench. It was my first love to, to be at the bench and working with my hands. I love um, being that type of scientist. Um, but then I realized that it wasn't really conducive to the lifestyle I wanted with my children. And so I transitioned over to doing more um, computational work and I love it. And it's it's just as fulfilling. Um, I remember the first time I went um, onto GenBank and I opened up, um, you know, the human genome, and I could see all the chromosomes and all the 
the DNA and all the different mutations and things like that. And I just remember it being like, I don't know, maybe somebody like looking up at the sky and wondering what's out there. It was like that for me, like looking into all of that information and being like, oh, I have access to all this. What in the world can I find? So yeah, it was something that I definitely knew was right for me. Um, let's see, what's the last part of the question was? If if there is a, a great demand, or what's the, the current demand for biotech? And what is kind of the, the learning path? to fill that role? Okay, so you have to work at it. It's not gonna just, you know, like uh, fall in your lap like anything else that you really want. Um, I would say uh, you have to put yourself out there if you really wanna do this type of job and um, attend conferences and let people know that you're available for work. Um, it's you know, some, some days are really full, some weeks are really full, and then some weeks I go without doing anything at all. And I'm fine with that, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a part of, you know, being a remote worker sometimes. And, you know, you just fill in the gaps with um, what you can, but it's definitely, the demand is there, you just have to find it. It's not as, um, I guess it's not as available as somebody doing like, I guess like front end development and stuff like that, you know? That stuff is just all over the place. Um, this is something you definitely have to um, look for and develop relationships with companies, with people, things like that. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, by the way, Patrick's questions. And Luis is asking also from UCSB, how do you call it? University of California, yeah. Santa Barbara directly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so he says that they have experience with uh, Mathematica and R, oh, yeah. um, and he's working if those languages are still prominent in the industry and used, uh, and not if, if if not which languages or what language. And I I'm gonna just thank for like for Luis here, sorry Luis, but uh, basically what would you recommend on that? that side for languages and technology for sure are um just because the statistical analysis associated with that um it kind of trumps everything for versatility um python so i think if you're going to learn a language so you already have r um that's already highly valuable um mathematica just depends on what you know what type of job you want to do and what type of experiments and data analysis um, you end up doing. Um, some people even like um, Perl. I hate to say it. I know it's like really old. I, <laughs> but I I encountered some software that was written in Bio Perl, and it wasn't fun. I don't think it's as common though. I think um, definitely the two top ones are going to be R and Python. Yeah, it's cranking and, and hopefully it's like the unifications are getting easier, the consolidation of the languages. There are a couple of uh, really smart smart libraries. One of them is Apache Arrow, and I'm just kind of mm -hmm. rumbling here. Apache Arrow is the is from Wes McKinney, the creator of Pandas, and they are br building this bridge between multiple programming languages data in memory. So Hopefully, in a couple of years, you know, you, it's going to be easier to collaborate with someone in R. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, so Tim is asking. I don't know if this is a simple uh, answer. If you have a simple answer for this question, but basically, um, what are possible? What are some possible projects that a computer science major could do in the biotech field? So someone coming from strictly from the computer science oh. field on breaking into biotech. Is there, is there room I'm gonna ask first and, and Tim asks, what are some possible projects? Well, I mean, you could always look for open source projects on GitHub. As far as something really specific, um, 
I know there's a there's a website called Rosalind. Rosalind as in Rosalind Franklin. Um, I think it's rosalind.org or something like that. Um, but that's actually a great website for teaching um, in sensuality and computer science. It'll be really easy for you. But what they do is they kind of teach you the biology concepts with the programming concepts and then kind of get you up to, up to speed on all of the, the biology terms. Because it's kind of just, I mean, it's like rote memorization at that point. And you just kind of have to figure out like, you know, like how DNA is the orientation and the common terms and things like that and the nomenclature, stuff like that. Once you get that, um, you could get a better understanding of just like the, I guess like the background. Um, and then as far as like a project, like a big project, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Is there, do you see, is there a room? It's like, uh, sometimes biotech, bioinformatics, it's like you feel that something is, is too much for your bio-related background. You think that you should bring someone specialized in computer science to build like infrastructure or something. Does that happen or everything is built and you can just work? No, I mean, there's definitely people who, who are just software engineers that work for companies that build software for biologists. You know what I mean? And then, then, then there's like the in-between in people and then there's like the straight up biologists that don't know anything about computer science. Um, you know, so you got your Venn, your Venn diagram mm -hmm. um, and you already know like a huge chunk. So if you know the computer side, the biology side isn't, I mean, yeah, it's not that difficult to just learn a bunch of terms. Um, so it's kind of follow up of the question of Rob Lane below that says, that, is it easier to get into biotech from a computer science? So from a computer, for a computer scientist learning the bio part or for a bio something, getting the, the computing part, is it like, is it possible in both ways? Is um, there one preferred? I don't know, because it just depends on how far you go on each in each, how specialized I guess you are in each. I'm biased, so I'm gonna say the biology part is really easy. <laughs> and the computer science part is more difficult. I don't know, to me it always seems very abstract, um, the computer part. It's like this imaginary, I don't know, world of stuff going on. Um, so I feel like you could easily just uh, take some I don't know, you can go to Khan Academy and learn some biology, you know, and um, kind of fill in that gap. And then you're gonna be overlapping a little bit on your computer side, but at least you have your your background. But I don't know, that's my opinion. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's that's... coming uh, as, a, as, a, as, as the one kind of running the educational space, I think, and maybe I am biased on the other side, but I think it's gonna be, easier to learn the computing part because there are so many resources. Yeah. I don't know how many bio-related resources you have. I mean, I've passed the basics of like molecular biology and Khan Academy, everything else, it maybe gets a little tougher. I don't know. So uh, yeah, we, we kind of sell, uh, settle nice. kind of in a, <laughs> in a drew. Yeah, you guys are so welcoming. The computer community, computer science community, you blog everything, you like list everything that you do. It's awesome. Yeah. It um for I think what I always think is like everybody in their field, you know, for 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 me, the computer science part is a piece of cake and the biology part is crazy. And you <laughs> exactly said the opposite. It's like, you know, the grass is green on the other side. It is, it is. Um, so how difficult here kind of following Kevin's question that has a little bit more background, if you want to read it later, I don't want to make it public. Um, but, um, Kevin is working professionally and he had a, he has a, um, degree, right. Um, but, uh, the question is how simple is, I mean, is it's possible and 
uh, what's the, the difficulties and how simple it is or how complicated it is on the other side to go to bioinformatics or, um, or biostatistics without a higher degree in neither of them. So without, for example, a PhD or, or something higher in relevance. Um, I don't think it's difficult because <clears throat> especially you already have you already have some degree. Um, so that's already shown that you have some kind of tenacity for studying and the ability to learn. Um, so moving on to to learning a you know a, a programming language and then applying it towards you know like whatever um, interests you like um, if bioinformatics interests you then um, it's certainly doable. There's and I I just know that because like there's there's also online bioinformatics degrees available. There aren't um, you know like masters and microbiology and, and things like that that are that are read, readily available but um just the fact that there are so many data science and, and bioinformatics and and things like that that are available online makes me think that it's it's something that could be easily you know like you can easily move towards that if that interests you um i don't know does that answer the question or yeah, so a, a little bit of encouragement. It is, yeah. just do um, it. <laughs> yeah. Just make Go it ahead. Especially having a degree, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just, just figure out if that's what you wanna do and talk to people in the field and if that's the case and just make the yeah. job. Definitely. Um, so uh, final question, Oscar is asking if, there are any skills in data that you think um, are extremely important to start with um, to for for the particular field? I know string handling is really important, right? So you're always handling handling large pieces of strings, right? But uh, yeah. can you follow up on that? Yeah. So for me, yeah, it's just I mean, like all the files are just it's just a huge text file of ATCGs. Seriously, <laughs> and then it's when the you download, same thing over and over and over. I, I, I can't even imagine an error message. And like <laughs> there was an, an error on ACDG. That that is not helpful. You know, it's like it's always the same thing. Yeah. So and then when you download, you know, GenBank records, it's just like a huge text file, and then they 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 format it so that it's a huge um, dictionary, and then they have these wonderful people who came up with this thing called BioPython that, you know, basically does everything for you. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, they just, they, they've they thought of everything and everything is documented and they have these little recipes that you can look up. But um, yeah, so as far as like the, you know, like handling the strings and the big text documents, like the BioPython is huge for that. If you're working with large amounts of um, data, I would highly suggest moving from Excel to Pandas. Um, I worked with Excel until I couldn't, until I until I broke it, <laughs> and, and then I had to figure something out. And so I was like, okay, this isn't working, and I was like, okay, so I should learn something different. And then Pandas is a game changer. Um, just being able to write some little thing and then being like, okay, here it is. Here's the data frame with everything that you wanted and all sorted all pretty like you want. And so, yeah, that's um, that's a huge one for data manipulation. Um, if you want to learn how to make really pretty um, graphics and graphs for your, for your papers, um, you know, like Matplotlib and all those, um, you know, it's it's yeah, great. Be born, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's so in, interesting. From what I hear, like you're still kind of in the basic data science stack of Python, like pure Python, string handling, pandas, right. matplotlib, adding maybe this BioPython uh, library, which is completely, of course, 
specific. Um, if you could, um, this is a hard question, sorry, but I kind of have a percentage of time spent with via Python. Is it takes like your 80% of your time via Python or is just the opposite or even? Um, yeah, when I'm, when I'm doing that, so when I'm not doing just, just data analysis, if I'm working with a bunch of sequences and I need to manipulate them somehow, um, somebody's 99% of the time, somebody else has already solved the problem that I'm trying to solve. And so a lot of it is, you know, Googling. And then I look in BioPython to see if there's um, some answer there. And for the most part, there is. Uh, I would say, and this is just my, my type of work, though. I don't know if it's true for all people, but um, I work a lot with looking for sequences that are alike versus sequences that are different. And so it has to be probably 80% BioPython, but I wouldn't know how, and you know, I'm like 20% Googling yeah. how to add the BioPython sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does take a significant part of time. So it, it is uh, an important tool basically. Like from outside, I wanted to understand how significant it was, but it seems like it's pretty important. Yeah. Um, so I asked you for only 30 minutes. We are kind of past on it. So maybe we can wrap it up. Sure. And I wanted to ask about kind of the future, the future of the field. I have uh, personally been reading a lot about DNA sequencing, CRISPR-9, these experiments of, uh, I think they were Chinese, Chinese lab genetically modified at twins yeah. and you know all that stuff and uh, if we're gonna get to Gattaca I don't know if you watched the movie <laughs> yeah I did a long time ago. That's an old one. <laughs> it's an amazing movie so are we gonna are we getting there how, how do you see them the future in the sector specifically and if you let yourself you know free in the imagination what do you see in the future so in, in my opinion, and of course I'm biased, so I think something that's going to be really huge is is digital health. I mean, think about it. You Just the amount of things that are just being um, enhanced with technology, I think the health sector is the one that's going to get the boost. And I think um, it's going to be a really exciting field. I just think of, you know, Amazon Health how could they possibly transform the health industry? We don't even know yet. And it's just going to be, I just can't wait to see what they do um, with like telemedicine and, you know, this whole, you know, talking to your doctor, you know, who's far away and um, per performing surgeries from, you know, robotics from far away. So this, this stuff is just fascinating to me. And I think that's an area that, is going to be huge and i'm hoping to be a part of it and i'm hoping that the remote you know community embraces um you know scientific work and you know done from anywhere in the world you know because basically we'll all benefit from you know an open source environment if we just help each other and collaborate i think it's going to be huge and so my opinion for sure it's going to be digital health um awesome. yeah so as far as like the the crispr kind of um thing going on with the the editing i don't like i'm not a geneticist but editing twins the the chinese babies i think um as far as i read i don't know if it's been peer-reviewed so it hasn't been submitted to any journal yet, and it hasn't been looked at outside of maybe like what he did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's scary. Yeah. It's scary because it wasn't really, um, it, it's not really accepted widely by the scientific community as something that's really moral to do at this point. We don't really know enough, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. your question made me laugh about Gattaca. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen in our lifetime maybe maybe well, not let's see 
I remember uh, reading that the, can we say creator of CRISPR? I don't know what name to put, put to her. It's creator, main researcher, uh, yeah. is this woman, I remember her name, but I remember that she kind of bashed heavily on these I Chinese think. labs saying like, you, can you guys went outside, out, you out, know, like outside of boundaries about yeah. it. And uh, I think it went to finally make kind of an agreement between multiple countries signing some sort of an agreement of not modifying things. So maybe it was a good thing to happen early. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a dangerous thing to do right now. I think we know we know enough to know that we don't know enough. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's always the case. And so it it needs to be put on pause for a little bit, whatever they're doing. I don't know if it's continuing or what, but awesome. All right. So do you wanna give any extra advice, any final word to someone that might be rating you later, listening now, um, career-related, job-related? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, I, I, I hate to look back and say, oh, well, I knew that was gonna happen that way. And, you know, it, I think things happen, um, you kind of just kind of, there's some things that you can plan for and some things you can't. Um, if, if this is something that you're truly interested in and you're in school, I think you should make an effort to to network. And it's horrible. And the introvert in me is totally cringing when I tell you that because I hate networking too. But it all of my all of my major clients have come through people that I know really well. And those are the best clients. Um, they always say that like the the clients that are really easy to get are usually the worst ones. So you have to really put an effort and, um, you know, talk to people. Um, there's a chance that you probably know somebody that works for a company that, that maybe you're interested in working with um, or working for. Um, so, you know, like reach out and, and make those connections. Yeah, it's kind of a new, a new feel you're pretty much discovering it and developing it. So yeah, yeah. It's building bridges among people and community. Yeah, that's right. It's hard, but. All right, so thank you very, very much. I'm gonna shut down this, everybody watching. Thank you. And we'll, we will be posting a transcript with uh, your answers later. So the the, the future biotech and bioinformatics can benefit from it. Thank you very much, Adriana. Thanks for inviting me.